morning. I have a simple question for you. Do you realize you hold the power to change your corner of the world? I realized the answer to this when I was a sophomore in college, and I had the opportunity to mentor a 13-year-old girl named Kathy who was in foster care. Kathy's mother was a drug addict and a prostitute, often doing her work in front of the child. Kathy was broken, voluntarily mute. She would follow me around campus, but she would never look me in the eye, and she would never say a word. And what, during one of our visits, she noticed a lovely cloth doll that my grandmother had given me. And I offered to let her hold it, and then I offered to let her keep it. And she hugged that doll so tightly, and she looked me right in the eye, and she said, thank you, Sandy. A few days later, Kathy's mother decided that Kathy shouldn't visit with me anymore. So I decided no child should suffer like this, and that one day I would adopt a child out of foster care. The first step, should you choose to change your corner of the world, find your passion. Everyone knows that passion is usually thought of as something that makes your heart sing. So if you love to read, go to a low-income school district, read to the kids, open their eyes to the world through books. But passion can also arise when you are infuriated by something. For me, it's foster care. So years later, my husband and I decided we would adopt a child, and we had to go through training through the Department of Children and Families. And during one session, the social worker told us a story. She said, a father came home one day, and he had a bad day at work, and his two-year-old was pitching a fit. So in his anger, he threw the child down the cellar stairs. And then she said, don't you feel sorry for the father? And I thought she misspoke. I thought she meant to say, don't you feel sorry for the child? But she continued on about how difficult the father's life was. I started to feel angry when I realized her meaning. And Mike reached over and he said quietly, don't say a word or they won't give us a child. <laughs> By the time I walked out of that building, I felt rage. And I decided that I would devote my life to trying to work on foster care. The second step, if you decide to change your corner of the world, stand on the precipice of what you're about to do. Take a deep breath and jump. Jump far and jump with joy. There is no well-worn path, but good people will find you if you put out your true intention. So let me give you an example. At Babson College, I'm an associate professor of practice and marketing. And one day I had the opportunity to meet an alum and who was guest speaking, and his name is Aaron Walton. And Aaron owns Walton Isaacson. It's the premier multicultural ad agency in the country. And after a few minutes, I thought, I'm just gonna ask him about an idea I have to create an ad campaign designed to educate and infuriate the country about the state of foster care. So I looked at him and I said, um, Aaron, does Walton Isaacson ever do any pro bono work? <laughs> and he looked at me and said, do we need to talk? So I gave him a two minute, very emotionally intense elevator speech about the outcomes of foster care. I told him about the 440,000 kids in care who get shuffled from school to school and home to home, carrying nothing but a trash bag with a few belongings. I think a trash bag is indicative of the value we see in these kids. I told him about the fact there are 111,000 children waiting to be adopted and no one wants them. Between the ages of 18 and 21, they get dumped out on the street to fend for themselves. 25% of them within two years will enter what's called the foster care to prison pipeline. There's actually a name for the path from foster care to prison. Most of the girls by their early 20s will end up pregnant, their kids end up in foster care.
When I finished, I looked at Aaron. He said two words, I'm in. And I went home, I was elated. But the next morning I woke up and I was like, "Uh uh-oh, what if he didn't hear the words pro bono and he thinks I'm actually gonna pay for a national ad campaign. So I typed him an email, dear Aaron, thank you for offering to do pro bono work on behalf of the children in foster care. And the email I got back was, you had me at foster care. More wonderful people came out to help me, some of whom are here today. And we named our organization the 440K Project, standing for the 440,000 kids in care. I wanted every single child in care to be represented in the name of an organization that cares about their welfare. Third step, final step, steal your mind. Steel is one of the strongest substances on earth. Let nothing and no one stand in your way of doing the right thing, no matter what happens. And I mean no matter what happens. So eventually, Mike and I adopted two wonderful boys, J.R. when he was five, and Elijah, who's here today, when he was two. Prior to adopting J.R., He had a horrible existence. When he was nine months old, there was a drug raid on his parents' house, apartment. And someone screamed, don't break down the door, there's a baby on the floor, and that saved his life. He entered foster care that night, covered in his own filth, unresponsive to human interaction. Fortunately for him, His foster mother would sing to him and cuddle him and let him know he was wanted in this world. JR went back and forth between foster care and his drug addicted parents for four years. Mike and I adopted him at five. We loved him, guided him, gave him the best medical care, the best school. JR was flying a plane at 16. But life was hard for him. At 24, he decided he was too old to take his prescription medication, and he had a bad day. So to alleviate the trauma, just a little bit, he took one pill, one street drug, which we now know was laced. JR died on March 8, 2022. Now, I have never quit anything in my entire life, but I was drowning in grief. And I said to Mike, knowing how hard it is to raise a child who's been so traumatized from foster care, how can I ask the nation to adopt these kids? And he gave me the only answer that would keep me going. Every child deserves a chance. In that moment, I decided to steal my mind. Looking back, JR would always say to me, Mom, you need to fix foster care, like it was as easy as making a cup of coffee. (laughs) Fortunately, we started the 440K project while he was still with us. And we started it when he was with us. And then I submitted a bunch of paperwork to the IRS to get a nonprofit status, a 501c3. A few months after he died, I got a letter in the mail. Congratulations, your nonprofit status has been approved by the IRS. As of May 10th, 2022, May 10th was the 20th anniversary of the day that JR came to live with us permanently. It was the day we started our family. So here we are, the 440K Project, 
stealing our minds, changing our corner of the world. So when I came out here, I asked you a question. And I hope you realize the answer is yes. You hold the power to change your corner of the world. So I have a second question for every one of you. What corner of your world will you choose to change? Let me know, because I know you hold the power to be amazing. Thank you very much for listening.